Thank you, everyone. I'm sorry to break up some great conversations. We need to get started in the, with our next panel. So I invite you to get seated. In case you are just joining us, we are very excited about this conference here. You can see that um, the Maxwell Institute is the main sponsor as well as the BYU History Department and Africana Studies here. Uh, we are starting our next panel, which is discussing the international di um, dimensions of um, the implications, the history of the 1978 uh, priesthood and temple revelation. I am Dr. Leslie Hadfield. I'm in the History Department, also the coordinator of the Africana Studies program here at BYU. I'll just jump right in. Um, as our first panel in this conference demonstrated, the origins of the racial restrictions placed on people of African descent in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints were firmly rooted in the American basis of the church. Because of this, African Americans have borne the brunt of the pain of this policy and continue a long struggle against its legacies. Without minimizing their central role, we also want to recognize the international dimensions of the racial policy the impact the policy had on the growth of the church and the actions of those in various countries who had a significant role in ending the restrictions and building the church in their respective areas. Some places had a racial and political context compared to, compared to the United States, especially places with uh, a, a history of slavery and multiracial populations such as the Caribbean, Brazil, South Africa. Yet each place has its own particular um, context and some places were completely different, such as West Africa, with no significant European settler population, or Brazil and other Latin American countries which have a different history of racial mixing. So people of African descent in all of these places proved faithful. They challenged church policies and challenged church leaders' ways of thinking. And in particular, we need to acknowledge the looming size and complication Africa posed to the church in the 1960s and 1970s. So I want you to take a good look at this map. You can see um, how big the African continent is. It is one-fifth of the world's land mass. I think today it makes up about one-ninth of the world's population. And when the church was considering the, the members of, in West Africa, they at first put them, if I'm not mistaken, within the European mission. If you look at the map, look how small Europe is compared to the African continent. Um, and when people say that perhaps the, when they speculate that the, perhaps the racial restriction was to um, save the church or save the priesthood, think about all the people who it did not reach um, within that time. As more and more people in West Africa re requested baptism, their insistence on fully accessing the blessings of the restored gospel exposed fundamental contradictions and, as historian Dima Probert put it, made the status quo untenable. This was not just a problem of not being able to use local leadership in possibly over 50 countries, although that was a huge consideration. Sustained interactions with Africans changed church leaders' minds, and Africans actively contested the basis of the racial restrictions. The period of the church in many of these places uh, after 1978, and again I'll put this other map up, also merits further attention, as some of uh, the people in the earlier panel talked about, as people and the church based in America deal with the dynamics of transitioning to a new, inclusive church, more global in its membership. These are issues still facing us today. Now, today, this panel um, is providing a snapshot of these international dimensions. There are many people we could honor and highlight. Some of them are in the audience today. Um, Sister Alice Johnson Haney is the daughter of uh, William Johnson, who helped um, build the church in Ghana along with Dr. Kissy. Um, on this panel, we are privileged to have three people who lived through pivotal moments in the history of the church in their respective countries and who have all engaged in teaching, writing, and preserving that history in one way or the other. I'll briefly introduce them so they have enough time to share their own um, stories and thoughts. We'll first hear from Dr. Emmanuel Abukisi, who is a medical officer, the founder and director of Desert Hospital in Accra, Ghana, and uh, Area Authority 70 Emeritus. Dr. Kissy graduated from Ghana Medical School in 1968. 
He performed clinical work in various hospitals, eventually finishing surgical training at the Royal College of Surgeons, Guy's Hospital in England in 1979. He was baptized in Manchester on February 8th of that same year, and soon after moved back to Ghana to serve his people. Dr. Kissy has held various positions in the church, including acting mission president during the freeze in Ghana, which we might hear more about today. Um, that was during 1988 to 1990. He's also been a state patriarch, Area Authority 70, and counsel to the mission president. He currently serves as Sunday school president, and he compiled a detailed history of the church in Ghana, Walking in the Sand, published by BYU Press in, 19, or sorry, in 2004. Okay. Um, after Dr. Kissy, we will hear from Dr. Marcus H. Martins, who holds degrees in business, organizational behavior, and sociology. He joined the church in Brazil in 1972 and served a full-time mission soon after the 1978 revelation. He has served twice as bishop, seven times as high counselor, and as a mission president. He has written a number of works, including the book Setting the Record Straight, Blacks and the Mormon Priesthood, and the manuscript The Priesthood, Earthly Symbols, and Heavenly Realities. And he is currently the Dean of Religious Education at BYU, Hawaii. Finally, we will hear from Dr. Kumbulani Mbleche, who was born and raised in the township of Kwamashu, near Durban, South Africa. He joined the church in November 1980 as a 16-year-old and served a mission from 1985 to 1987 in the England, London, South Mission. I believe he was the second black missionary from South Africa. Mbleche received his bachelor's at BYU Hawaii in history, a master's here in Provo in instructional science, and a PhD in education at the University of Johannesburg. His publications include articles in religious education and BYU studies, including a personal reflection on the, the 1978 revelation published just this year. And Bletu worked for the South African government in education before spending 21 years in church education systems, seminaries, and institutes, 10 of those years, 2003 to 2013. He was the area director when they were implementing church education in 28 countries of um, Africa's Southeast area. He is now the church history advisor for the entire continent of Africa. So I will give each panelist 20 minutes to speak, after which we will open up the session for discussion and questions. And I want to reiterate um, the protocol for today. When we have um, the opportunity to ask questions, we'll have a microphone here. And we ask that if you have a question, you come here and um, form a queue or a line. I just got back from England. And, um, then we will have ask you to please state your question in the form of a question. Um, please keep it brief. I know we like to have the context that's important, but please um, keep it brief so that we can have many people uh, as possible engage in this conversation. Um, please then, when you're finished asking your question, give the microphone back to the usher. And uh, if you have any um, more comments or discussion you'd like to follow up with the um, panelists afterwards. I'm sure they'd be happy to do that. So with that, we will turn the time over to Dr. Kissy. Thank you very much, Leslie. I am happy to be here. Thanks for the invitation. I bring greetings from Ghana, and uh, I am going to. Uh, I've enjoyed what has gone on, you know, this morning, especially the detailed historical account. I am impressed. I am going to tell you what's going on now, and um, because I'm telling you my personal. Uh, witness of the church as it's going on now and uh, I have as witnesses uh, Ernest Junior Miller of, of Harry Utah of uh, Blue Ribbon Beef uh, fame is here he's one of the first missionaries who came to Ghana and uh, I have also um, Ralph maybe uh, his father and uh, brother Kenan were the first two official missionaries that the church sent to West Africa after the revelation. So I'm telling current historical account, and uh, yeah, I'm happy that I'm here to do the justice. Uh, I was born 24 December 
1938, and I was baptized one week after that. Uh, I was born 24 December, and I was baptized 29th, 31st December, one week. The Presbyterians love to do that. And I was brought up very beautifully by the Presbyterians, but along the line, I went to a boarding school of an Anglican uh, school for seven years. The first five years, religion was an exam examinable subject, but the two years were not examinable. And the, the church, the, the school, needed us to be disciplined. So they kept us, kept us up there and they introduced the philosophy of religion. We enjoyed that, but when you do philosophy of religion, if you have a lot of questions, Sometimes you embarrass the uh, instructor who was a British uh, priest for the school. Now, in my boarding school thereafter, um, in secondary school, uh, we had this difficulty of religion, and uh, we, some of us, be a Presbyterian and others, had to uh, protest against uh, Anglicanism, and so we had to go to town and join our churches. Now, with this, I learned a lot about religion, and uh, I was interested. I loved Christianity, and um, when I went to medical school, I didn't have enough time to do a lot of reading of uh, church history and things. So I uh, had to uh, abandon that program for a later day. Now, in 1976, I was to finish my surgical training at the Royal College of Surgeons of England in London. And when I was going there, I had one very interesting, fantastic idea. If there is anything more to know about Christianity, which I didn't know, and I was sorry that I, I didn't think I knew everything. If, I need, if there's anything more to know, I should find it there in England. And when I finished my surgical training, 11th November 77, I had to now look for the church that I was dreaming about. Now, we were in Manchester, stick of the church. And uh, I combed Macclesfield where I was uh, working, and I didn't have uh, any answer. And uh, one evening, uh, my wife called, she's here with me fortunately, and asked me to uh, confirm an appointment for midwifery uh, to work as a midwife. Uh, because he hadn't been going to work. He was uh, depressed, he was afraid of the unknown, and uh, so she was home. And uh, so I uh, asked her, why, what's, what's going on? I know you are afraid, I don't want to go and meet any people in the hospital. So I'm, I'm well now. And I said, how come? So well, uh, two young men came knocking at the door. And uh, he found out that they were missionaries. And he said to them, well, I have a problem. I have severe depression, and I cannot go to work. If you can heal my depression, then I can accept that you are real ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then I will be able to join your church. And so the two young missionaries uh, got together, they prayed, and they anointed and blessed her. As soon as they said, Amen, she felt very well. And she discussed with the missionaries how she can manage to be a member of the church. And uh, they said, well, you have to ask permission from your husband. And so she uh, needed me to know but she was first ready to work. That was a surprise. So, uh, 
Soon thereafter, the, the missions came to me at the hospital because I was almost all the time in the hospital, unfortunately. And um, we had a discussion, and uh, we brought them home with my wife and our children, three of them. And finally, on February 8, 1979, the two of us were baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by immersion. That was the first time we got to know about that. Now, after that, I realized I was going to practice surgery for 40 years of my lifetime from that time. But I realized also that because my, of my uh, interest in the church and baptism to the church, now I'm going to have the ability not only for 40 years or thereabout, but I was going to be in the situation that I would, after the resurrection of the dead, uh, have the, possibility, the, the, the chance of immortality and eternal life with God. God says about this, my work and my glory. And the end of my journey should have been there. I got my surgical training. I found the church that I was looking for. But then the journey had not ended yet. At this time, my wife had taken up an appointment as a midwife at the Macclesfield Infirmary. And um, he went to work, and her companions, the nurses, the midwives there, were wondering, how come a black woman that you can think of becoming a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? And they um, tried a lot to dissuade her, and she told them about her experience with the missionaries, which was very astounding. But they, they still prevailed upon her. Finally, she gave up. And uh, one Sunday, she came home after night duty from the hospital, and we were expecting that she'd be ready to go to church. Then she said, she's not going to church with us any, any longer. And uh, so I got the three children with me, and uh, we went to the church. Now, she came to church, unknown to us, sat at the back, and this was a, a first a testimony Sunday. She sat at the back, we didn't know about that. Suddenly, she, uh, we saw her walk to the front to bear testimony. Then, at the testimony, she told them and asked why the discrimination between the blacks. Because God says all are alike unto God. But why the discrimination? And so there was a lot of uh, the missionaries, the South African. We were the first black you know, family in the church in that city, Macclesfield. And uh, the returned missionaries of their wives came. They were sorry that while they were missionaries in South Africa, they refused to have discussion with the blacks. And they all were very sorry, and they, they apologized for what had happened, and we were happy. Uh, we didn't do anything about the policies of church, whether there was discrimination or racism in the church. We had no idea. That was the first time we had come into contact with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And uh, we, we didn't know about that, so that doesn't bother us. But the, the, the much, you know, uh, effort by the nurses at the workplace made her to uh, sort of be very disappointed. Now, after all this, we came back to Ghana in 1879, September, and I went to the hospital. My first day in the hospital, I came across a lady in bed reading from the Doctrine and Covenant that could identify from the back, because one of the pink books, and I asked, who are you? Are you reading Dr. Jason's books? They said, oh, who are you? I said, Dr. Kiss, oh, missionaries from Salt Lake City were here last month, August, and they were looking for you. 
and uh, so they will come back. And uh, she made me to understand that the church was being organized in Accra and some other parts of Ghana. And so I uh, followed up and tried to look for some of these people. I got to know about Raphael Abraham Frank Mensah, well, who has a doctorate degree, I don't know what subject, but uh, he had become very inactive, and most of the people were with him, who were with him had also uh, sort of gone their various ways. And so there was no church as such. So I uh, organized to see some of them, and then we, we got together, and gradually more members surfaced, and uh, I was their leader, an unofficial leader, because nobody had known that I was there doing that work. And uh, finally, uh, when Accra was organized on 4th May, 1980, uh, in the house of one U.S. Embassy staff, Lowell Diamond, I was called to be the branch president in Accra. Now, after that, there was a lot of effort to uh, build a church in Accra. I had known that outside of Accra in Cape Posts, and uh, J.W.B. Johnson, uh, Joseph William Billy Johnson, and his daughter is here, uh, she spoke, yes. And uh, he was the, the, the one who was holding the fort a lot because Mensa had sort of fallen by the way, and Johnson was the one who, who held the fort. Uh, so I went out there to, uh, to follow up what they were doing and added my voice to it. And as I used to say, I was like a one-eyed man in the country of the blind because I was the only one who had been in the church in action in England. And all the others were, they were not baptized into the church, but they were following Johnson and the other people until the canons and ladies went to West Africa, Nigeria, and Ghana and baptized a few of them. Uh, I believe Mensah was the first person baptized into the church and William Billy Johnson was the second person baptized at the same time. At that time I was still in, in, uh, in England and I hadn't gone home then. Uh, when the church then was organized in Accra and in Nigeria. The mission president was in Nigeria for three, week, three days, three weeks in a month, and one, one week in Accra. And uh, so it went on and uh, until until the church uh, was uh, developed sufficiently to have access to some of the necessary uh, performances of the church. Now, all this time, I didn't know Mensa and I didn't know Johnson, and there was uh, Johnson had gone to Cape Coast to establish a church there. A lady, Rebecca Mould, went to Takradi to establish a church there, a lady. And uh, later on, when the church had become significant, the districts in the West and the district in Accra were brought together under one district, the Ghana Accra district of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I was called and uh, set apart as a district president for Accra. At that time, it's only Ghana and Nigeria that had a church. 
of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints. And as I said, May Bees and the Canals were the first official missionaries to that place. And uh, Millers were in South Africa and they were performing as uh, missionaries there. And the active mission president in Ghana had a problem. He had to be, he, they had to be called back home to the US. And so the Millers were sent an emergency call to come and fill the place. Junior Miller is here, and uh, he came to fill the place, and uh, we were the two companions. Uh, because I had my private hospital and uh, I could do whatever I liked, I was able to go around with him most of the time around the places where the church was functioning. And so Miller and I became like a senior brother and junior brother. And the, way the two of us were able to do a lot to bring the church where we finally uh, got into trouble with the freeze of the church. Now in Ghana, we now have large numbers of uh, states. I cannot, I've, I've lost count. And uh, in Nigeria, they have a lot more. I think Nigeria has about 50 states, and uh, Ghana has about 25. And uh, this is all that we need. Uh, maybe, uh, Brother Maybe is here. He's somewhere sitting on my left here. And uh, his father is the one I was uh, talking about. Now I will uh, leave my stand. And uh, I know there will be question time, and the question time is where maybe more information will come up. I've just sensitized you to uh, know that the church is in Ghana, the history is different, it's still unfolding, and the players are still here. And so you can ask any question you want. I've got my son here, he was about five years when we were baptized, and my wife here, she's the one who uh, was told to go to the church. Go, tell them. And uh, if they are saying the blacks are cursed and uh, you, uh, you are worried, go and tell them. She went to the church on the Sunday, she sat at the back, and when he got the stand, he said, why do you say the blacks are cursed? God says, all are alike unto me. And why do you say the blacks are cursed? And uh, she was weeping. And after that, as I said, those who worked in South Africa and were part of the racial, racial activities of the church, who had that experience, so they were almost in tears. And they were happy that the Kisi family had gotten this far and that the church uh, is here in Africa, in West Africa. This is my little report, and I will give you the chance, whatever question I can answer, Please do ask. Thank you very much. Since I have lived a third of my life in Hawaii, good morning and aloha. Thank you. Yeah, I have lived a third of my life in Hawaii and uh, almost half of my life in the United States. So, uh, so I'm speaking to you in English and I greet you with a heartfelt aloha. A few months ago, um, at a conference sponsored by the University of Utah Standard Humanity Center, uh, also marking the 40th anniversary of the 1978 revelation, and uh, I spoke of a few of uh, my past experience with the priest of Ben, and also some of my views and expectations for the present, present and near future of individual members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in, with black African ancestry. And around that time, uh, in fact, a little before, if I recall correctly, I received the invitation to be here with you today, and I'm truly honored. 
uh, to be here. Uh, and I want to thank the Maxwell Institute for the Department of History at BYU and the uh, Kennedy Center. I received my PhD from BYU, and as I was telling, uh, uh, security guard uh, at the entrance of the parking lawn, he said, yeah, I was here before you were born. <laughs> so, yeah, time flies, and, uh, and um, I, uh, I'm delighted to, to be here and uh, see so many friends, including my former neighbor, Naive Phil Smith, uh, right here, David Lucero, so many others. And uh, I can't see you now because I took off my glasses so I can read my remarks, but uh, really looking forward to shaking your hand later. Now, back at that speech that I gave in June of this year, um, I, stress, uh, I stressed some of the views for the current and the near future. And among some of the things that I said, I would highlight this morning the following. Uh, the great revelation uh, on the priesthood received on June 1st, 1978, attests that at its heart, the religion we profess is primarily a religion of blessings, not curses. A religion not based on prejudice and segregation, but one of divinely established principles of righteousness ordinances and covenants available to all humankind. The 1978 revelation also provided a hidden lesson for the future. One cannot pay respect to the past using as currency the dignity of others in the present. And I also stated then that just like the converted Lamanites in the Book of Mormon strengthened the Nephites at one point in the Book of Helaman, my hope for the future is that not long from now, we will see more and more black members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and other races and ethnicities and language groups being people whose presence refines and blesses other members' discipleship in Jesus Christ. Today, in this particular session of this conference, asks us to explore international dimension of the 1978 revelation. It is a great honor for me to participate. And, uh, but from the outset, I must uh, uh, make clear that my participation in this program must be far more due to historical reasons than for any professional expertise on my part. I joined the church with my parents, Professor Ruda Martins, in 1972. So we lived the last six years of the so-called priesthood band. But although I am black, I do not study black uh, members' experiences in the church. Uh, there has never been a research topic of interest to me. I don't know, it must be something in my genes. Uh, I'm part Portuguese also. Maybe that's my white side speaking too loud. <laughs> you think that's funny? You should see the ethnicity of my grandchildren. German, Swiss, and uh, Guatemalan, Honduran, go figure. <laughs> now, but because of that, uh, uh, the fact that I was born and raised in Brazil, and the cultural conditions in Brazilian society, especially where I'm from, Rio de Janeiro, very mixed, very cosmopolitan, uh, I do not fit, and now that I've lived half of, almost half of my life, in the United States, I do not fit the customary profile of an African American. Although at this point in time, uh, 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 culturally, uh, I'm very much Brazilian. But after living for so many years, I have incorporated some of American culture, but not particularly African American culture. So with these caveats in mind, as I pondered on what to say this morning, um, I felt strongly impressed to follow up on that speech that I gave in Salt Lake City on June 30th of this year and um, explore a few additional personal perspectives and expectations for black members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but this time looking into the distant future. So I have been asking myself in preparation for today, now that we have lived 40 years since the 1978 revelation, 
what would be my expectations for the next 40 years? During which I'm going to probably look like that and later be dead and maybe looking like that. <laughs> yeah, my students laughed when they saw this, uh, when I announced this. They, 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 had a, they had a big laughter. But I told them, look, I don't expect to, be, to live to be 100 years old. So during these next 40 years, you will hear that I, that I have been transferred to that mission that does not end in two years. So I'm talking about expectations here, not only for the remaining however many years of my life, but also expectations for the lives of my children and my grandchildren, who are very racially mixed. And some of them, because they are adopted, they are African Americans, and one of them, in fact, my only grandson so far, is white. I knew somebody was going to laugh, and it had to be Dr. Stokes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so you know, I tell people, look, I can never go out here in Utah, you know, and take my son, my, my grandson, you know, on a on a on a hike. I'm gonna get arrested, you know, in, uh, for child kidnapping or something. When I tell the police officer, no, this is my grandson, the police officer is gonna say, yeah, I mean, I'm the Queen of England. <laughs> so yeah, that's. Uh, but anyway. What else would I possibly want to see in my own experience in my remaining years, which President Gordon B. Hinckley used to call golden years laced with lead, and in the experience of other black members of the church internationally? Other than to know that during those four decades, these next four decades, my grandchildren will render service in the church, and my great-grandchildren will serve full-time missions, I want not much, really. But that little that I want for the future is indeed very significant. However, as a sociologist and disciple of Jesus Christ, I see that on the international arena, we have a far bigger fish to fry ahead of us. The conditions of the world are deteriorating at an astounding rate. We still face not only persistent chronic poverty, but also endless regional skirmishes that threaten to escalate into a new world war, vast flows of refugees, and changes in the climate balance, of, in the delicate, uh, uh, delicate balance of, uh, of nature that seem to affect our climate in very dangerous ways. But a challenge I have been thinking about the most in recent years is the resurgence of racism. Once again, we see around the world despicable racist ideologies being used to justify and reinforce feelings of racial pride and superiority. And we see populist national leaders using those despicable ideologies for self-serving purposes. Extremism in various forms is gaining ground rapidly, changing the fabric which binds many societies, to get, societies together and allows for peace and progress to thrive. This threat is so pervasive that it can disrupt, and in a few places might be already disrupting, the fabric that binds that subset of larger societies composed of members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Only a concerted effort to bring millions of people around the world to Jesus Christ and the truths, ordinances, and covenants of his restored gospel may save individuals and families from a destructive whirlwind fueled by partisanship, tribalism, jingoism, laced with sexism, and outright racism. During World War II, so Allied soldiers from various races and ethnic backgrounds banded together to fight Nazism. And the current conditions of the world require that we likewise leave aside all the considerations and focus on the major task at hand, to resist evil, cleanse ourselves, provide ministry to others, and help prepare the world for the glorious return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Since the scope of this theme would be, require far more extensive analysis than the available time we have in this conference would allow, from this point on, I will limit my analysis solely to the sphere of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints rather than larger societies internationally. So, how can we prevent racist views and actions from once again becoming widespread and, heavens forbid, institutionalized 
uh, in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the 21st century. Personally, in my, own act, in my own actions, I consider that it would do little good to me to continue speaking of the past, bemoaning the priesthood ban and its associated pseudo-doctrines. In fact, I have started to decline invitations to speak about that topic. Just a couple of months ago, stakes in England and Portugal honored me with opportunities to speak. Initially, they suggested that, you know, the priesthood ban as the topic and my story, the story of my family, my father, my mother. But politely, I offered to speak of the results of my research for my forthcoming book, The Priesthood, Earthly Symbols and Heavenly Reality. Uh, incidentally, that strategy uh, with, uh, didn't work with the Church History Department. Uh, historians wanted my personal story, not my views on doctrine. And as the same goes, the customer is always right. <laughs> and that pretty much summarizes my personal stance about this nowadays. The priesthood ban happened. It is and will always be part of our collective histories as, uh, as uh, our collective history as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But the ban should not be a major concern nor have any significant effect on our present. I acknowledge that there may be isolated incidents involving racial prejudice in wards and stakes and congregations in which one could point to a possible residual influence of those pseudo-doctrines used for almost a century to justify the prison ban. I myself have had unfortunate experiences in a few rare occasions. And allow me to pause for a moment and remind you again of the possibility of a significant difference in the frequency and magnitude of those my experiences compared with those of African American members of the church. Now returning to my analysis, I wonder, would there be uh, uh, would there still be a potential residual influence of those pseudo-doctrines associated with the priesthood ban in the early 21st century? And if so, how pervasive and effective would that residual influence be? Let's face it. Most of us often cannot remember the specifics of what we discussed in a particular Sunday lesson just one week later. Are people really quoting those old ideas about the curse of Cain today in our Sunday meetings and Sunday classes? And if so, would there be entire congregations hearing that and still thinking, black people are doomed? Let's say that one finds 12 people who, be who believe that. Honestly, as far as I am concerned, as long as those 12 people or hypothetical 12 people are not sustained to serve in the court of the 12 apostles, I wouldn't lose my sleep over it. <laughs> for over a decade, I have been arguing that this is a time for activity, not for activism. I believe that it is by active engagement with and service to the largest society of, of members of the Church of Jesus Christ that we will demonstrate, uh, if it's for me, tell them I'm busy, I can't answer it. Okay. It is by active engagement with and service to the larger society of members of the Church of Jesus Christ that we will demonstrate that as the Apostle Peter stated, indeed, God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. And also that, as Nephi stated, indeed, God, all are alive unto God. My faith is that in the next 40 years, God will continue to impress the minds of these and future generations of local church leaders to have more and more members of different races, ethnic and linguistic backgrounds all to serve in leadership positions in their wards and states, not merely as singers and dancers in social activities, but as equal partners in teaching, service, and ministry. Like the ancient Lamanites, as these members serve and exhort their, their fellow members to faith and repentance, preaching with, exceeding great, with exceedingly great power, the Holy Ghost will touch hearts, and any potential residual influence of those pseudo-doctrines associated with the priesthood ban will diminish more and more 
until it becomes practically extinct. Those ideas of the past will always be in our collective memory, but they don't need to exist in our hearts. So that's what I personally have been all about in recent years, offering my faithful service in the church and in my community, and offering my now four decades of professional experience to organizations that need my leadership, regardless of my skin color. In the process of doing this, I hope others have seen and will continue to see that race is not a significant factor in our relationship, not in service and leadership. And they will slowly abandon those notions of curses and divine disfavor that were institutionalized in the past. And my faith is that by doing so, the good Lord will renew and extend the falling words and promises to me and to all other faithful disciples of Jesus Christ from all nations, races, and ethnicities. Hold on thy way, and the priesthood shall remain with thee. Thy days are known, and thy years shall not be numbered less. Therefore, fear not what men can do, for God shall be with you forever and ever. Therefore, fear not. Do good. Let earth and hell combine against you, for if you are built upon my rock, they cannot prevail. Thank you very much. Can you find me that picture? It's a question. You need to respond to it. No. You can't find me? No. Oh, thank you, Prof. Uh, Professor Smith is fine. Okay. Well, my name is Kumbulani Mizeche. I live in Johannesburg, South Africa. I come the fattest. Anybody can argue with that? Yeah, and uh, I am grateful to the Maxwell Institute, uh, to the History Department, and uh, many other people that have worked hard to bring me here. And uh, I want to thank in particular my friend uh, Leslie. Um, um, uh, we go a long way. She's the only one who speaks Kasa like me in this room here. So, but uh, I, my home language is Zulu. I'm a South African who speaks Zulu. And um, my wife is here also with me. You have heard earlier on a, a, a Ghanaian accent. You have heard a Brazilian American accent. Now we are hearing a Zulu South African accent, so I'm grateful to be with you and, um, and to share a few thoughts uh, that I've been invited. I've not been invited to speak uh, like an academic, I've been invited to speak uh, and share personal experiences, uh, being a member of the church, growing up in South Africa, and what has it has been like to be a member of church at that time. So. Um, um, my country of South Africa is probably um, a very different country on the African continent. We have 54 countries. And the, the reason probably it is different, it's because uh, it has a history of 400 years, over 400 years of whites living in South Africa and black people living in South Africa. And another characteristic that makes it a little bit different than any other African country is that uh, the church dates back uh, in 1853 in South Africa. So Paul, right after Brigham Young gave that speech in 1852, in 1853, he sent missionaries in South Africa. Why? Because South Africa was unique, it had a white population. And he could defend his statement, why he stand there. So I think that is important uh, to, to remember that. Another context that you may want to hear, I mean, I went this year as a part of my profession to make a proposition to say, this year, let's have something to celebrate this momentous occasion, just 40 years of history. Those who were supposed to make that decision were hesitant. And part of the, the hesitancy is because of the sensitiveness in the South African context to begin to bring about the issues of race. And so as a result, we're not doing much at all to celebrate this uh, great uh, and important occasion. Well, um, let's see if I can get this uh, right. Okay, so 
I mentioned to you that the church began in 1978, uh, 18, 18, 1853 in South Africa. And all the way up till 1978, the church in South Africa was mainly white. And it had, by the time 1978 came, about 10,000 members of the church. And um, the 1978 uh, 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 revelation changed the church in that uh, for the first time the missionaries could now go to all the communities. It is important for you to understand that 80% uh, of the population in South Africa is black and only 10% of the population is white and the rest is made up of other minorities that are found in South Africa. Um, that's me. I'm standing in front of our home in Gomashu. It's a township just north of Devon. I was born in the mid-60s. I, I know I don't look it, but it's, it's, it is true. I want you to believe me, because I'm telling you. And the, as a youth in 1980, I was 16 years of age, and I was playing on the street with my friends. And um, a car pulled over. There were about 16 of us who were playing soccer. And when that car pulled over, we noticed that there were two white people in that car. We ran away. And here's the reason. In the townships in South Africa in the 70s and in the 80s, only police, white police, would come into the, south, in, into the township and they would chase us away. They would break any meeting of black people that is around. And so at this time also, we sensed that this is what was going on. But something was different. When those two white men asked us to stop, we stop and we listen to them. And two months later, I was baptized into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I was 16 years of age. I was politically aware of what was going on. For many months and many years, this is right after the 1976 Soviet riots. And so we had been politicized. And all of our conversation in the township was about how to push the white man back into the ocean where he came from. Because of... Um, uh, really, maybe let me just say more into this because of two things in South Africa. There are more things, but this one make it an important sense: colonization and apartheid. Colonization and apartheid combined together really reinforce what I call white supremacy, white privilege that we see all around even today, and in South Africa more entrenched by the rules that we have. And so those two had entrenched this whole idea that white people were better than black people, but also created laws that really pushed white people, so black people, so that they don't have the same privileges as white people. And the Church of Jesus Christ of our Saints in South Africa, it is established within this context. The context of apartheid and the context of colonization. And um, I walk into that kind of a church. I remember my first district conference, you know, I joined the church when it was one state, it was in Johannesburg, and so Devon was still a district. I remember my first district conference I went to, we were seated according to racial groups. And I don't blame the people, and Paul here has our discussion with me and you, the context. And I don't blame them, because some of those people are some of my greatest friends. But it was what the society dictated at the time, that black men and white men cannot come together. It is within this context that I joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. As hard as it was for me, I remember as a young boy growing up, my very own friends challenging my membership into the so-called white church. And um, I didn't have as much defense about faith, but my defense for this was about my friends who were white, who had helped me cross over to the other side. All along, I've been growing up in the township being on the other side, and all you have ever thought about how to get rid of white people, how to remove them in South Africa. And all of a sudden, I was pushed on the other side now, where I understood, that, by the way, that not all of them were that way. And, and so it was, <coughs> excuse me, within that context that I joined the church, and I mentioned that uh, there were less than 10,000 members of the church, and, they were, and then mostly were white when I joined the church. Afrikaans was a, a language, sometimes I meet a, this person who served in 1960s, I want to speak Africans to me, I can't even understand the word of it, but I just move along, you know. 
and uh, it was no temple in South Africa when I joined the church and uh, and uh, wine state and no MTC and etc etc as we think about uh, uh, the, uh, the 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 church as a whole. So then something happened in 1985. I received a mission call to go to England and then South Mission. I packed my bags. Can you see? Those of who were young, those were the bags we were using in 1985. <laughs> we didn't roll them. And uh, I'm, I'm in front of the Devon airport today, and I'm walking so that I say goodbye to my family. First time on the plane, first time on a beautiful suit, and uh, I'm heading to England. When I arrived in England, after about two months, I, I, I was knocking on the door with my companion, and I had my first door. The, the, the door that I had, it, I was going to knock at it, and I knocked. A tall man opened the door. He was black. He had dry dogs. And uh, I introduced myself. I said, I'm Aaron Gletcher from South Africa. This is my companion from the United States of America. We're the representative of the Church of Jesus Christ of the United States. And I said the key word, thanks to President Nelson, he has asked us not to use sometimes called the moments. The moment I say that, sometimes at the moment, his whole countenance changed. And he looked at me and he said to me, you a woman, and you are black. How can you be a member of this racist church that does not ordain blacks into the priesthood? That was the first time I heard that. I had been a member of the church for five years. Done many, many things in the church in that five years. For the first time I'm hearing this message, I turned to my companion. <laughs> and I said to him, is it true? Without even thinking, he said, yes, it is true. The man at the door shut his door and walk away. And not just me and him looking at each other. And when we sat on the side of the road, I said, I said, tell me, is it true that you are cursed? He continued to say, yes, it is true. Then he did what he shouldn't do. He went through the scriptures proving how black people are cursed and how the church... 1985, <laughs> I was devastated. And here I was representing a, a racist church. I come from a racist country. The two things that matter the most in my life, my country and my church, both of them could not accept me as a black person. It was a sad day in my life. I went, I, I decided to call the mission president. I had made my decision. I was going home that night. I called him. I said, President, I told him everything that had happened. And I said, tonight I'm going home. Let me give you the name of my mission president, Ed J. Pinder. And uh, he invited me to his office. And when I walked in his office, uh, we began this conversation. I related to him again what had happened. And then he gave me a line that sustained my membership with all the difficulties, but continued to sustain my membership. And he said to me, yes, it is true that black people use not to be ordained into the church. And then he said, but you don't know the reason. I was young. I trusted this man. I believe in him. I had to make a decision between my companion who, who, who we slept in the same room with, he cooked my food, I cook his food. And this man, who is my president, whom I love. But I believe him. And I continue moving on with my life. I left uh, my mission and um, I came to BYU Hawaii, BYU Provo. I attended the religion classes. I continue to hear the name Kerst. With my fellow students, it continued to be. I returned back to South Africa. Somehow the white people in South Africa, I find a new voice. Apartheid is coming to an end at defending their position. And the word is sneaking into conversation. That black people are cursed. My wife is here with me. One day we were sitting in the same room, same class of Sunday school, with a dear friend of mine who grew up with together. And he, the, the Sunday school lesson was going on. And right there, when the Sunday school was going on, right the subject of priesthood came in, and somebody in the back said, black people are cursed, and one day they will become white. As a friend of mine who had served a mission, university graduate, packed his back right there in the classroom, and he left. He never came back. And um, so, 
it has been a struggle, this idea. I want to conclude with two quotations. And uh, the first one is uh, from El Asatati. Some of you may know him. He's a general authority of the church, the first black African general authority. He is now serving in our Africa area presidency. This is what he, he, he made a statement uh, that is published. And he said, uh, he said, most active adult African saints who have joined the church since the, the revolution of the priesthood for all male members know that this is a reality of the past. I'm one of those. This is a reality of the past. And my mission present helped me to understand this. And have found individual answers in the restored gospel of, of the plan of happiness that give them an understanding and peace regarding the unfolding events of the gathering of the saints in this last days. Does the MC keep in time? Okay, thank you. And those who have found answers choose to look forward to the future with faith and assurance that all things are before the eternal Father, that his justice is to all men, and that his redeeming love and mercy are extended to all who tend to him with full purpose of life. This story I'm going to share with you epitomizes what we've just read. A friend of mine whom we served together in 1985, he's a Zimbabwean, he's not a South African. But if you know the history of Zimbabwe and East of South Africa, it's very common in terms of apartheid. He had a dream in 1983, 84. He had a dream. And then in this dream, he saw a big building and with a long name, but couldn't read properly. And then uh, he woke up. He, he was searching for something, as he tells me. You know Africans, they're always dreaming. And uh, this is just a typical African story, so be patient with me, as I tell you. And then he wakes up, he wakes up in the morning, he decides, this is a church that he must go and find. He walks the streets of Harare, looking for this church. And he found this church. And when he looked at the name, he realized, this is the church of Jesus Christ. And he says to himself, this is the church I've been looking for, that I dream about. Then he looked inside, he found all white right people. Then he goes and calls his friend. His, his friend who, who, who's older than him, who speaks English. He said, can you go and find out if, 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 white people, if black people are allowed in this church? And then when he goes and finds out, if the bishop tells him, yes, black people are allowed in this church, he goes in, he investigates the church, he gets baptized. And then later on they call him to be an investigator, teach a class, to investigate, to teach the class of the investigators. And um, he, then they bring a white man to come and make sure that the doctrine is straight. <laughs> we do it in, in South Africa and in Zimbabwe, but we don't do it anymore. Okay? <laughs> so, and, uh, and then this, this white man is there every time, and then comes the subject of the priesthood. Just when he starts talking about the priesthood, this white man in the back raises his, his hand. And he said, did you know that black people used not to receive the priesthood? <coughs> And then they ask a reason why, because they are cursed. Half of the class pack their bags and they leave the class. And then he stays. He tries to, to bring them back to stay so that he can continue with his lesson. Then I asked him a question. I was interviewing. I asked him a question. I said, Joe, you are now, you've served a mission. You've been a member of the church for over 30 years. What is it when this man tells you that you are cursed in the classroom that caused you to, stay, to sit? Ever such a uh, comment here, says it all. And he says to me, this is a friend of mine, he says to me, I had a dream. He said, he said in this dream I knew. I knew that the church was true. He said, that dream convinced me. And I knew that the, this is a church that God gave it to me. No man would take it away from me. Marcus, thank you when you said that uh, the 12th man. If it's not the 12th man, I'm staying in this church. And that's what he said. He said, I had a dream, and the dream was true, and therefore I chose to stay at the church. And he lives here in Utah right now, raising a great family with a wonderful wife, faithful in the church. I conclude with an apostle, Elder, Elder Quentin L. Cook. He said this, we are all equal before God. His doctrine is clear. In the Book of Mormon we read, all are alike unto God, including black and white bond and free, male and female, accordingly, all are invited to come to the world. Anyone who claims security under the Father's plan because of characteristics 
such as race, sex, nationality, language, economic circumstances, is morally wrong and does not understand the lost true purpose of all of our mother's children. My brothers and sisters, friends, colleagues, I, I just want to say that um, because I grew up in a racist society, I hate racism. I know what it has done for my country. You know, I still live in South Africa, and, and every day we, 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 we experience racism in South Africa. Even though it's after 25 years since Mandela came out of prison and, and, and brought a new South Africa, in the fringes we still have people, and it pains my heart. It pains me. It pains me now when it happens once in a while in the church. And so, all of us, we need to be united. And thank you to Brigham Young University. When I was a student here, I wrote my thesis on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on the experiences of black, Afri of, of black African students at Brigham Young University. There were less than 30 of us. And we had it in the classes. The racism, the, 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 the black being, being cursed. We heard it very strongly in the classes. You read my thesis, you hear those statements. And thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. All right, I'd like to invite all of the panelists to come to um, take their seats up here. We have 20 minutes just on time. That was really good time management for everyone. I really appreciate all of that. So while they're coming up, I invite those of you who have questions to come down to this side of the, um, the room here, and we'll have uh, a microphone here. And again, I remind you to keep your comments, your question, remember it should be a question, should be brief, and then if you have some follow-up discussion, you can um, do that afterwards. We'll just have the microphone set up. So please, if you have a question, you can come over. Okay. Hi, my name is Kirsty Wayland, and I'm a recent BYU graduate in sociology and African studies. And my question is, um, when people, especially members, ask us whether blacks will be white in the resurrection, because it's a question I've been asked before, how should we respond in a way that is firm, but um, compassionate and understandable for both sides? Well, I, this uh, question has been going on for a long time. It's always come to my mind, and uh, I've been referring to the scriptures. And when this comes to my mind, there are a few examples that I use. When Moses was uh, going to be sent by God, and he was doubting that he can go to Pharaoh and challenge him. God said, put your hand into your bosom. And they said, take it out. When he took his hand out, what had he changed to? Which color had he changed to? White. What was Moses' color before? He put his hand there. Evidently, it wasn't white. When Moses and Aaron and Miriam were traveling with the Israelites. And Miriam was very uh, insulting. And uh, God got angry with Miriam that he doesn't have respect for Moses, who is his representative. And God called Miriam, Aaron, and Moses to the temperature of the congregation. And he said, Miriam and Aaron step forward. And God showed anger at Miriam, and Miriam did not respect Moses, 
he didn't respect God. And immediately, there was a color change in Miriam. What color was it? He changed to white. So they were all white. They were not white. Gehazi was sent by Elisha to, att uh, to attend to the general of Syria, who had come with great power, coming to heal the white skin that had fallen on him. And so he came and uh, he was healed of his white color. And Gehazi followed and took the gift that was bringing to Elisha. And when Elisha asked uh, his assistant, where did you go? I went nowhere. So when you followed the Naaman and he gave you a gift, I saw it all. And he cursed Gehazi with a change of color. What color did he change to? Who knows? White. So the people were not white. I think my other evidence is that when God created Adam from the dust of the earth, what color do you think he was? The earth is brown. So I don't see where, whether the white color is a curse of Gehazi and uh, Miriam or a sign of uh, to Moses. I mean, but it doesn't mean anything. This is my style. It is from the scriptures. And people have their own interpretation of what they read from the scriptures. But for me, I have no problem. So when people say white is superior, black is inferior, that is all what, what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the fact. After all, if they say Cain, when the flood took all the people away, and Noah and his family, eight of them were left, where was Cain? And in any case, when Cain was cursed with a change of color, what were the changes of color? Did it change from the ordinary brown color that God gave to Adam and Eve to white? So that if he was black and he put a, a change of color on his forehead, it may be black? Or if he, if he was black and he put a, a change of color on his forehead, it would be white? This is not said. So for me, I go strictly by the scriptures. And if people would want to understand me, this color distinction for people and that, my idea is different. And so I have no problem. Let them say what they want. Say what you like, the poet said, all things love me. Thank you. Uh, just really quick. No, our time is going by fast. Uh, if uh, if I were to be asked that question, I'd never be, and I don't know exactly what I would answer. It's one of those kind of spur of the moments, you know. In retrospect, after the fact, you say, I wish I had said this, I wish I had said that, but, but I don't know, but on spur of the moment, I probably know in myself fairly well after 60 years. I think I would be inclined, not necessarily to go to the scriptures, because I'm not I don't, I'm not as certain as Dr. Kesey about what they looked like in the past, nor am I sure about what God himself looks like and what his race is. Um, and, uh, and so, but I would go to the doctrine and I'll say, well, I know that God lives. He is our loving father. He has a plan of happiness. And I'm happy with my father. So in the resurrection, I'll be happy being a little, you know, <laughs> You're feeling the blank. Yeah, well, I think that uh, we just have to not to be shy to face the reality. The reality is that the person who's saying that is a racist. So you need to just confront and say, I'm sorry, that is a racist attitude that you're playing. Um, and then we, 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 need, we, need, we need to do that. And we need to really work hard to. To, to address the question of color privilege. Because there was an idea that a person is perpetuating. They're perpetuating the whole idea of color privilege. And unless we confront that, and we confront it on the spot with the person that is raising, we're not going to be winning that. 
when he leaves your presence, that person must know that uh, you have actually hidden where it, it is so. And that is their racist, and they will stop it. Okay. I'll be quick with my question. I'm taking this, this question is for Dr. Kissy. When you're in the UK, um, when you went back home with your three little children and your wife, what did she tell you happened that pushed her to go back to the church? Well, um, when we left church and went back home, that's the first Sunday, and uh, she now told me what had happened, why she came to church after all, when she refused to go with us. She was in bed after night duty, and then she heard a voice. Go and tell them, if you do not understand what they are saying and you do not agree, go and tell them. And uh, she, got, she woke up and they found that there was nobody in the room. So she went back to sleep again. And then she heard the voice again, get up, go and tell them. Go back and tell them, I am the one who has signed a covenant with you and not those people. So go and tell them. So now she was fully aware, she was awake. She went to bed again and then she was pushed out the bed. So then she realized that it was a serious matter. So she put on all her, whatever it was, the came to church, sat in the back. And then she was hesitating. And that, that unknown, unseen person pushed her, said, get up and go, get up and go, go and tell them. And that's why she came to the front to tell us. And that's, I think I, I missed this part of the story, and that's why my, my referee has come to remind me. And that was a very experience, you know, a very uh, outstanding experience. When I heard the story of Jesus Smith, and when he asked, uh, which of all these churches is true? That was basically the question I was asking. And when he got the answer, well, I was not going to reinvent the wheel because Jesus Smith had already invented the wheel. Many people were working with it, and I didn't know, and I was still asking. So when I got this story of Jesus Smith, all my search had come to an end. Thank you. I, I think that's a, a good reminder, too, of the role that African women have played as well. And I'm really very grateful that Sister Kissy is here with us. Okay, we have time for, um, I think we can, I'm going to change it a little bit. I, I would like us to have maybe two questions and then two or three, and then the panelists can respond to all of those at once just because of the time. So if you'll just keep your questions short, we'll have two or three more questions and then move forward. Okay, um, hi, my name is Trina Showalter. Um, I was just wondering, how has the revelation on priesthood helped um, impact uh, family history work and in your area? Great, okay, thank you. Um, mine is, uh, I'm just asking for a clarification um, because I, I think that um, I might have misunderstood uh, Professor Martin's uh, uh, talk about how race is not a significant or important part of uh, membership in the church today. Because um, I think you mentioned that you are a sociologist, and I think with that idea, I think um, history and race is a very significant part of identity, and dismissing that uh, significance is going to be for me, um, very confusing. And the fact that even today, 2018, there is still uh, confusion about the history proves that we either don't want to accept the fact that this is the way things are or that it is present in our today's um, church um, um, lives and as members of the church. So I want to know, I want you to clarify a little bit about, about that, um, how why you think race is not a significant part of a membership. Great, thank you. One more. 
So this kind of goes off of the culture idea, but I was curious to know for each of you how your individual cultures, with your families, with where where you're from, how that influenced your accepting the church. Like, how did your culture um, help you come to know that this church was true? Thank you. Okay, so we had the three questions. One about family history. How did the, uh, the revelation affect family history? Two, the one particularly for Dr. Martins about uh, race in the church. Um, and then the third one about how the culture influenced um, your interaction with the church or joining the church. Should we go the other way? This time we start with Kundalini and then okay. So on the first question of family history, I hope you, you're not confusing me with, with the church history department with the family history. Those are two different uh, uh, the kids, but of the same family. Um, so um, within the uh, African content context, um, family history um, is, uh, has some challenges but uh, we are overcoming them as a church. The main challenge is that uh, as Africans, we never kept records. So everything is uh, handed down from father to son. Only in the last uh, 30, 40 years that uh, we started to have records really that can help us uh, keep the history, the, the family history. But despite that, uh, we have uh, fully established family history centers and uh, the technical work is going on, and so it's being conducted. Uh, on, the, on the question of racism in the church, maybe I, and um, if it's significant or not. Um, oh, it's for you, okay. What is something I said? No, no, no. Okay. Okay, the, 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 the third question, the culture and the church, it is a big issue. Um, Just give you a couple of examples. In the last five or so years, the church has worked hard to, to help our young people who are planning to get married, not to subject themselves to the Lobola system or the dowry system, because that has delayed a lot of young men from getting married, having to go back and, uh, and work and while they are working, trying to raise the money to pay dowry, they find themselves uh, uh, doing that, which is not right. So that, that, that has been a, a big, 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 big issue. And uh, I, I can say that uh, I think we are slowly winning it. Uh, the parents that have children in the church, or those that have joined the church young, they understand that uh, eternal marriage is important, and they can do it and be successful without having to spend a lot of money trying to raise the, the dollar. So this is just one example. So there are a lot of cultural issues that we see in the church when it comes to our context sometimes that will conflict with what we call the, the culture of Christ. Um, but it's being addressed and uh, addressed successfully. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, once a uh, uh, prophet mentioned something on racism in the church, I'd like also just to make a comment on that because it's a significant part of the world where I come from. Well, the significance of race uh, in Ghana, we do not have much of this racist uh, idea because you haven't had a large population of white uh, in the country that will stand out and uh, feel superior than everybody else and that everybody should uh, sort of uh, bow down to them and serve them. Our interaction with the white has been uh, with the British until after our independence, the Americans came in and other people came. But they came as, you know, partners in business. Uh, when colonialism ended, the British were our masters. It was a question of uh, somebody who is more powerful, uh, taking uh, somebody for a ride and uh, say, I'm Lord over you, and uh, when I come stand up and salute, it didn't refer to color. But when independence came, 
uh, of the change of that authority, and the British have to accept, and uh, the, the Ghanaians uh, have to take their position as owners of, their, of themselves. So it has been with the British, uh, you know, colonies and areas where the British were the masters. So we didn't have any of this uh, racial uh, discrimination thing. And when, uh, when, when my wife was first told that uh, you cannot be a letter they say as a black person. We, that was the first time we heard about it. And uh, as I told her, um, through her, the church has come to the family. I had done a lot of research looking for a church that I thought would teach me all about what Jesus Christ wanted me to, to, to know. And she, through her, the message came to the house. And then we all accepted it. We are baptized, we are tested of the fruit of the powers of the priesthood in the church. Now when these people are telling you this, don't mind. We got it, we will let it go. So, we, I mean, we didn't have any problem with racism even in the church, because we didn't experience it. I, we are, we're out of time, but we can take five more minutes. To, to allow them to finish. That's okay. So the brother asked the, uh, for me to clarify, and I found here uh, on my notes, uh, sort of, I spoke about uh, in the future, uh, people of different races, ethnic and linguistic backgrounds serving uh, side by side in the church, and I said, in the process of doing this, I hope others will continue to see that race is not a significant factor in our relationship, not in service and leadership. And they will slowly abandon the false notions of curses and divine disfavor that were institutionalized in the past. So, uh, no, I was not making any reference to uh, racial identity and uh, um, or uh, I, I, th I thought it was fo not a thought. I, I was focusing on relationships. And if we think about it very carefully, our relationship as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints is based on the restored gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not based on culture or language or, you know, whatever social mores of the larger society. It is based on the covenants we make, which are the same. And so if we, if we need to look at, okay, what is the nature of my relationship with my brothers and sisters in my ward in my, in, in my branch? Yeah, we have to go to the words of Alma the Elder in Mosiah chapter 18, the Book of Mormon. We have to think of the words of the baptismal uh, ordinance or the, the words of the, the sacramental prayers the words of all the covenants we make in the, in the house of the Lord. These are the things that unite us for eternity as disciples of Jesus Christ. And none of them are impacted by race. Now, our relationships may have a certain impact. And what I'm saying is that as we interact as fellow disciples and fellow servants, we will see less and less of our relationships being impacted by race as a factor. So that's what I, what I wanted to clarify. You just have a couple more minutes. I'm a gent, okay. Uh, it, it, within the South African context, uh, we, we, because uh, race is still a, a sensitive issue, what we have found is that uh, as we work together, which we encourage a lot, and in fact, uh, you will hardly see in South Africa a state presidency that's just made up of just one race or an auxiliary leadership that is just made up of one race. We really, we really try and discourage that because we think that, as the prof has just said, is the only way really we can bring about racial harmony is if we work together because when we work together, we begin then to see each other truly as brothers and sisters. We, we, we look beyond the race. But if I live in my own enclave, I will never know how other people live and how other people think. I think about my own experience as a young man. It was 
it was the white members of the church in South Africa who took me to their homes, who spent time with me, who helped me transform so that I don't look at a white person as my enemy. I don't look at a white person as a, 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 a not a welcome person in South Africa. I think if we continue to do that, try to find opportunities to work together, we will build a better, I uh, nearly said a better South Africa, but a, but a better church. <laughs> I, I really believe that we will build a better church and we have to build a better church. It, it is us being conscious to include those who have not been included in the past. It's a conscious decision. When you're a leader in your city, you're making a decision. Make a conscious decision. What can I do to include people of other races? What can I do to include gender, other people of the different gender, in my circle of this process I'm going through? If you can do that consciously, then we can get where we want to get. I want to thank all the panelists. We are so honored to have them here. And I hope that you will all seek out the things that they have written um, to learn more about their stories and to learn more from them. Um, and I, I think we've seen the range of different experiences and wisdom that can come from those in the international church, if we, we call it that. Um, so I'd like to ask you to um, join me in giving them our thanks by clapping. <laughs>